Okay, so we'll start. Um, so, good morning to the session that is we'll talk about machine learning. And uh, so to, tomorrow will be, uh, again, uh, more detailed machine learning. But my job is to introduce you to the ideas that are in the line map. Uh, I don't expect that many people. Uh, is there someone who know a bit about machine learning? Ah. Oh, no, it, it's my niece. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, so my name is François Labiret. I'm the, one of the co-organizers of the, of the summer school. I'm uh, the director of the Big Data Research Center and also a member of the GENAL group, GRAMI group de recherche en avancée automatique de l'Université Laval, meaning as a um, machine learning research group. And the acronym GRAL means Holy Grail. That's the trick why we have this uh, Holy Grail that's on the logo. Okay, so let's start. So, uh, let's start with explaining what is big data. Because most of people heard about big data but don't really know what this is about. So, let's start to explain basically what is the problem with big data and then we'll focus on machine learning. Okay, so uh, my favorite definition of big data is the 4V definition. Uh, so what is big data? First, because of volume, okay? And so uh, you, you already know what is a meg, because it's the, uh, the memory of your uh, computer, the memory of your hard disk is a gig, a gig, a uh, terabyte. So, someone who really likes videos may have a terabyte of data in their home. Um, Beta is something that like super university, exa, uh, zeta, and iota, and so on and so on. Each time you multiply by a thousand. In fact, by a thousand twenty-four because it has to be on uh, 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 base two. Okay? That's a binary situation. And most of the time when I speak about that, people don't really understand how big are those things. So I found on the internet uh, uh, the allegory of the rice grain, okay? So suppose that uh, a bike, okay, which is basically a sequence of eight, zero, or one, okay? A bike, suppose that it takes the place of a grain of rice. This is not the case, of course. It's much, 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 much smaller in your art list. But suppose it's a grain of rice. Then what is a K? It's a, it's a, it's a cup of rice, right? What is a meg? A meg is eight big bags of rice, right? And what is it? a gig? It's three big trucks of rice, okay? A tera is two big uh, container boats full of rice. Not supposed to be uh, in fire, okay? And uh, what is peta, uh, petabyte is it's basically if you cover Manhattan of rice, okay? And an exabyte, you cover the, the west coast of the United States of rice. What is a zettabyte? You cover, you, 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 you fill the uh, Pacific Ocean of rice, okay? And what is a yota? Byte, it's basically a, a, a ball of rice of the size of the herd, right? And there are the uh, companies that are dealing with zettabytes. So with the ocean Pacific, the, the Pacific Ocean, Google, eBay, Amazon, Facebook is not so far from the satellite too. Okay, and uh, this is explain why they are all in the uh, in the West Coast basically because the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is what a, a problem. But problem is not only to define what is the problem with big data. The second problem is velocity. Velocity means that you have now data that are gathered by sensors or by high throughput technology that uh, uh, always come to your uh, to your storage facility, and you have to deal with this velocity of our arriving of always new data and so on. You have to take it into account at the time when the data is coming. Look at it automatically and put it in some place where you will be able to find it if you need it, right? The, the third B is varieties. Now you have some uh, data that comes from text, 
uh, video, Internet of Things, uh, omic data. All those stuff are not supposed to talk to each other. So how to make those, this variety something that can be intelligible? This is the, the third B of uh, the big data problem. Uh, and the, the, the last one is veracity. You have high throughput technology, yes, but it's much more noisy. You want to look what happened on the uh, social network? There are some, what is called, fact. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to deal with them, OK? And, and on my, my side, it's when you deal with those Vs, not, not necessarily all of them, you deal with big data problems. That's meaning that basically you are dealing with a big data problem when you are working with microbiome and only data and so on and so on because of the, the variety of the, of the stuff and the fact that it is very noisy, right? But you are more particularly dealing with what we call fat data instead of big data. And this is a very, very complicated issue for a data analysis. Normally in big data you have millions of examples on, on which you have some feature that characterize all examples. And so it, it's easy to, to make machine learning calculation and we, we don't care about making errors or, or things like that. So, okay. so that data is exactly what you are dealing with. You have few examples, few patients, on which you have the, the whole genome plus uh, some area assay plus the clinical data plus the microbiome plus 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 plus. So we have a lot of things that you know on each patient, but you have very few patients. And you want to do statistical learning. Machine learning is by is based on statistics. So this is really a big problem that we will try to address today. Okay. Uh, you know that in life science, fat data is an issue. I don't have to, to convince you about that. Okay, now machine learning. Okay, this is the uh, the Drucon way uh, Venn diagram that exists for about ten years that explains, in some way, the new reality of big data. All right. So basically, in 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 traditional situation, you have the domain expertise, people who are working on genomics, for example, that make some experiment and then they go to see a statistician or a mathematician to construct a model that will explain what they found. Okay. What happened with big data? It's the problem is the computational issue. The data is too fat, there are too many things to, to observe, or too big. Okay? So what you have got is this problem of computation and then this is why machine learning start to be interesting. Okay? Um, I will explain something about the danger zone today. Uh, just a, a cartoon for, for, for things. It's, we found that the correlation in the data, everyone uh, who uh, shaved uh, his head have an uh, increase in their sale. So the boss say, everybody take a razor, right? So this is the kind of false decision that we can make if we are not aware of the danger zone. Okay. Um, but I, I will really try now to give you insight about what is machine learning. I, I'm not thinking that you will be able to be uh, uh, autonomous on machine learning after my talk, but you will understand what are the principles and what can be done and what are the danger zones, okay? So machine learning 101. So first, the definition. I like the one of Arthur Samuel. Uh, Bill of study that gives the computer the ability learn without being explicitly programmed. So the idea is in machine learning, basically we are going to learn by examples. Right? We will give some examples to the, to the computer and we let the computer infer the solution. Okay? In more data, I suppose that you have some uh, reviews from Amazon uh, about films, right? And you want to know if those reviews are positive or negative, because you, you don't want to see a film that is, has a negative review, for example. So how, how can you do construct a, a predictor to, to, to understand what is uh, the sentiment into a text? The text is a, uh, for a computer is it's a sequence of, of letters. 
it's not something that has some kind of interpretability as we have. Okay. So what what is the trick? Is you give to a human a lot of example of, uh, of uh, text from Amazon, and you ask him to label plus one if it's positive, minus one if it's negative. Okay, and then you, you give to the learning algorithm, you give to the learning algorithm all of this data. The learning algorithm constructs a function, which is a classifier, and you, you, the, the term is the classifier, but it's basically a function. That will do what? We'll take a new example that has not been seen by the, the human expert, and will infer most of the time with the correct label if it's positive or negative. Right? More precisely, you have training data that can be text, image, uh, omic, omic data, mass spectra, mix of them, anything. And what we are doing in, in machine learning, we are trying to convert this data in, in, in a sort of way into a vector. Okay, for example, if it's text, it's, uh, what we can do is you look at the dictionary uh, of uh, English, for example, and you, you look at the first word of the dictionary, it's A. And you count the number of times A appear into your text. And this will be the value of the first coordinate of your vector. Then you look at the second word and you count again. And that's it. This is a pretty stupid way to convert a text into a vector. There are better way to do that, but you have to be yeah. okay. And then what we can do is we have to hire a, a human expert or find a way to have label for our a training example. Then you give everything to the, to the algorithm. The algorithm gives you out a predictor. And for any new times that you will have see this kind of data, you will have your predictor. That will be, most of the time, correct. So this is the idea. So of course, you, you can predict phenotype, for example, based on that. So you have a, a batch of patients that are uh, uh, that has pro problem, uh, and then uh, Chrome tool group. You take a lot of different data, and then you make the learning algorithm find out if you have a sufficient, sufficiently enough uh, label example, then this will work, right? Um, okay. Uh, there are many different uh, labels that we can consider in, in, in machine learning. Uh, the one that we will focus on will be plus one, minus one for today. But you also, because you are a controller or you are a patient. Okay? Uh, but you can also have multi class classification. You have text and you want to see if the, uh, the text is about sports, politics, economics, so, and, and, and so on. So you, you can have many classes. It can be a real value, which we, then we call it a regression. You want to predict the weather tomorrow. <laughs> okay. uh, by the way, the, uh, the summer is beginning during my talk. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, because it, it's a hot subject, we are supposing to have a hot weather after my talk. <laughs> the summer will be up. Okay, so, uh, but you can also have a very complex object. You want to predict, for example, a, a, a pet park. Uh, you, you want to predict a, 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 a sentence in English. For example, in question answering system, you ask a question in English, and the learning algorithm gives you the answer in English. So this is a structural. Of course, this we are very good at. This we still have something to learn. Okay, so in classification, what you, I recall you that you you always have to define your example through a, a vector space. You know, the vector space is about dimension two. It's the value of g one for some kind of value in the value of g two, and this gives you an example. Okay, and you have examples that are uh, control, and this are passion or this person. Okay, and you want to find a, a separation between the, 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 the bad ones and the good ones. In your regression, what you have is you have a, a value that you want to predict. So you want to find as far as possible a function that will 
be about able to predict your, your stuff, right? Okay, Paul. Um, what should be the task for uh, the machine learning? Okay, so we want to make a predictor that will predict plus one or minus one, or will predict the regression value that we want to see. Okay, but not an example uh, that we already have seen, but an example to come. Okay, so to do so, what we can, we should look at? Of course, we have to make fewer error on the example that are given in the observation that we are we have to learn. But if we only focus on that, then we will overfit the data. Meaning, and this is particularly true in a situation of fat data. For example, the, 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 oh, the color is not very good, but there are some bunch of red, there are a bunch of blue. You want to make a predictor that will uh, uh, decide which, which is the area where you have to decide blue and which are the area where you decide red. So here is an example of uh, a predictor that makes no error on, 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 on the training set. On the example that I've seen, there is no error, believe me, because the color is very bad, but there is no error, okay? And so from the point of view of the training set that I had to learn, I'm perfect. But you can imagine that if I have to classify an example here, no. Yeah, it's better. Yeah, it's better. It's better. Okay. I have blue, red. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if, if if I give you an example there, my predictor will say blue, and probably I, I will be wrong. What what is the problem here? I too much focus on the uh, on what I've seen. Okay. Uh, probably it will be better to accept to make some few errors on blues but have a much more simpler uh, function. Okay. You call the old camera or if you can do a simple thing, it's better. And, and it's working well, it's better than to have a very complicated thing. Right. And there's some theory about that, if you guarantee. You also, you, you also see this overfitting, underfitting situation. Okay, you want to fit uh, a curve on, on, this is not machine learning, this is basically a, Pure math. You want to fit uh, a curve on your data points, and what you decide if you you are considering only uh, 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 lines as possible uh, function to fit. This is the best one. This is not good. You are not good at in in, in the point that you have seen, and you will not be good when you will, will see new points that are not in your data, right? On the other side, if you take, for example, a polynomial of degree 15 in this situation, then you are very good in your training set. But if you suppose that this is basically the true rule that you want to fit, then if you have point here and here, you will not be good. So for example, to come, you are not good. <coughs> for example, you have seen, you are good. So all the trick for machine learning is to find ways to produce this. Not underfitting, not overfitting. But unfortunately, we cannot see this true line. This is not known. So this is all the problem, right? Everything is clear up till now? Good. OK. Now I decide to present you some learning algorithm. I won't get too much into the detail, but I think it's important to see how it works and what kind of, uh, uh, of predictor you can construct with that. I'm not sure that you will use it by yourself at the beginning, but you can then ask someone that is a specialist in machine learning to help you on that. But to understand a bit how it works, I think it's a good point. Okay? So what is neural network? Everybody has heard about it, right? There it is. So, so the word is known. Now you will see what it is, right? So what is a, what is a neural network? A neural network is simply the, the following. I recall you that uh, I say that you have to transfer, at the beginning, you have to transfer your data into a vector of dimension b, 
right? So in a, in a neural network, the the layer, the first layer, is simply your vector, your input vector, right? Not more, not less. Okay. And what you are trying to do when you try to learn a predictor from the neural network point of, algorithm point of view, you want to know how to transform this vector into a new vector that will be a new representation of your, your, uh, your sample. But uh, if, if you work correctly, this new representation will be more adapted to the task that you are interested in. I don't say you for now how to do that, but the task for the neural network is to find a new representation that is much more close to the task you are interested in. Okay, so for example, this is an image, and you want to learn a representation that will help you to decide if there is a cat or a dog in the image, right? And if, if you are doing it properly, if this is a suitable representation, then each neuron has a positive or a negative value. Okay, and so if it's positive, you think that it's a cat. If it's negative, you think that it's a, 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 a dog. The other one. Okay, and, and what is the idea of that? And then you can simply take a majority vote of what the output neurons are thinking. If the majority thinks dog, then you will you will predict dog. If the majority is thinking cat, then you will predict cat. And it's a majority vote that is not democratic. You will put more weight on neurons on which you will be more faithful that they are good, right? And how how can you learn this W and this V? The trick is really relatively simple. You take your first example in your training. You put it there, and you will initialize, for example, W as uh, the transformation where everybody is at one. Okay, and V as uh, the transformation that is the democratic code, everybody is at one. Okay, so you put your, your first example, you look what the W transform is doing into, uh, into your uh, output uh, layer, and then you take your majority vote, and you look, and the prediction is a cat. And the uh, true value of your uh, training set is a dog. So your, your, your neural network is making an error. Uh, what you are doing, you will do some what we call back propagation by gradient descent and, and many mathematical tools to <coughs> readjust the, 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 the weight of the W and the V. And then you take the second example. And the second example, predict correctly. Okay, you do not yet. And then you take the third example. And if the third example is not correct, you will adjust the weight of the V and the W. And you repeat that millions of times until we have some kind of convergence. Right? That's it. That's all. Yes? Suppose the neural network also have to work first on the training and then on the testing? No, I'm only on the training for now. I will explain you how, how when the test set is, is, is happening at the end. But now I have some training set. I reserve some test set, but I have only training set, and I'm only working with the training set in order to find the correct value of W that will give me the suitable output layer. Yes? How do you define uh, convergence? Is it you? <laughs> this is, there's a lot of different possibilities on that. You can keep some kind of validation set that looks how, how you improve in this validation set that is not exactly what you use for training, but some kind of intermediate set between the train and the tablet and so on and so on. And then there are some early stopping strategy. A lot of different strategies. And you have also a lot of possibility of number of neurons, of number of weights of W that you allow that they can be non-zero. A lot of possibility of constructing different a neural network, right? In fact, if you like uh, Lego, yeah. okay, you will like uh, Degree because you make a lot of construction on 
we you have an idea that you, you put you put your construction exactly like you were doing when you were young and you were building some kind of bird by some little stuff. Okay. Uh, it, it's not so, so easy to manipulate, but it's not so difficult neither. Okay. Uh, everything is fine for neural network? Yes. Just a quick question. Is it too early to ask about sort of the scale of data, the size of it that it's needed to actually achieve? Uh, yes. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, with millions of examples, we are very in, in a confident area with neural networks. With lower on that, we have to be wise. Uh, but we can manage. With fat data, it's an issue. There's a lot of people who are working on that to be able in health science to make use of a deep learning approach. It's not something that is being done yet. But I think if it, since everybody knows deep learning, and it has to be the first algorithm I showed you, right? That's okay. So just remember that we try to learn a new representation of the data that is more suitable for the task. And we try to do it by observing the data and adjusting the, the, the W and the V weights. Yes? Quick question. Should we always use the same number of positive controls and negative controls for training set? It's always better if you have balance, but it's not always the case. When you are in an unbalanced situation, so a lot of, for example, uh, control very few patients or vice versa, uh, there are some techniques to adjust. Okay, but uh, it's always more difficult when you have the unbalanced stuff and, st and stuff like that. And then you just you don't have to, you cannot just look at accuracy, which because suppose you have 99.9 percent uh, percent of your data that is plus one, and the rest is minus one. So the the best predictor you can have is always say plus one, right? So then the this will be very accurate. You will be make only one person. 0.1% of error, right? So then you have to take a, into account matrix. It's not only the number of error that is, is an issue, but the the balance of the data and so on. Okay, but I, I mean, it can be a, a year of explanation what is machine learning. I have one hour and a half. <laughs> okay. Yes. Oh. Okay. But is it here for now? Yes. Yes, a little thing that I didn't say, it's when you make the transformation, so you take x, the value x1 times the, the value of this, this uh, weight that you put on the arrow plus the value of x2 times the value of the, that you have on the arrow and so on, and this gives you the neuron. But you don't leave the neuron as it is, you have to, uh, you have to put it into some kind of uh, function that is not linear because this is linear transformation and to work you have to combine a linear transformation to, with a non-linear function. The reason for that is, is because of, basically because of deep learning. It's if you take, uh, if you don't take this, it's the same, then you can combine V and W into a, a simple majority vote that goes straight from there to there. Because the majority vote the majority vote is the majority vote. So you have to you have to make some kind of break between the linear transformation that is here and the linear transformation that is there. And the way you are doing that is you true you, you take the value that you obtain and you you take the softmax for example or you take any nonlinear function. And this will allow you to have many layers. Okay, and the deep learning is a neural network that has a many layers. Okay. Uh, I tell you about representation. Okay. This is the first uh, problem that has been solved by, uh, by uh, deep learning. It was in 91, I think, by Jan Lecker. And so what we realize is for the, the task of finding which digit we have, the, this is not an interesting representation. <coughs> the algorithm find that it's basically what is in the middle of the five that is really de deterministic to decide that this is a five. 
It is data driven. It's not me decided for the algorithm. But the algorithm they say my good representation for a five is not this, it is that. Why? Because think think about it. If you take your five and you just translate it a bit, from the point of view of the matrix of pixels, they are very different. But they are both a five. Right? So the suitable representation must be more, uh, if you, you must not be uh, very far apart if you may just make a translation or a small rotation of, of your uh, white pixel. Right? And you see also <coughs> that you start with a black and white matrix and you have gray matrix there. Right? In another situation, you can see this is a deep learning network, right? A convolution deep learning network for people who learn about this. And if you can see that at, in the entry, it's about the facial recognition. Okay, in the entry, what you have is the matrix of pixels. That's that's all. And then you try to learn many different layers. And what they find, of course, I think that people from deep learning have worked, uh, worked a lot to find this example because it's beautiful to see. I'm not sure that you, it will be the same in every problem. But what, what we are doing is the following. It's they, they, they realize that in the first layer that you construct, the, the, the face is now transformed. And in the, the, the algorithm is looking for, for uh, in French, it's the, 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 the lines that you have in, in your face. And when you continue to learn layer and layer and, and, and upper, then the, the, the algorithm is trying to to identify those eyes. So this person now is a combination of this eyes and this eyes nose and this ears and so on. And at the last level, the one that is suitable for making the decision, the person is now replaced by a combination of artificial faces. And this is why it's, uh, it's robust now. Because if she start to smile, for example, or she just turn her head as a matrix of pixel, there are two different matrix of pixels. But they will be basically the same uh, combination of those artificial faces. Right? So this is the strength of deep learning. It's it learns representation. Okay. And uh, there is an example that where deep learning is very, very useful, it's for image. Okay. So I, I recall you that for a, uh, a computer, this is a matrix of pixels. For a human, what is this? For a human, it's a thousand words. A huh? picture worth a thousand words. So how can we transform this matrix of pixels into a story? And this is exactly what machine learning is about. It's to make some unstructured information and to start to structure it in some way. So this is a car, this is a road, this is the sky. Of course, we make some errors. This is not sun. This is, in French, it's the pool. What we have in Montreal, a lot. OK? In Toronto, too? Yes. <laughs> in spring, at least. OK? So, so this is exactly what machine learning is about. is to pay, take information that is not well structured for what we want to do with it, and to try to start to structure it. In, in a more uh, intelligible way. And you can see now what we can do. This is quite impressive. This is from uh, Stanford. So automatically, you, you, the, 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 the predictor said that this is a woman in white dress standing with a tennis racket. Two people in green. Yeah, no. There's no in a human intervention. You give the, the, the picture and it, it gives you the story. This is another example. So uh, a dog play, uh, play catch with a white ball near a wooden fence. OK, there are some million of exam turning examples behind that. But I, I will say that this is a risk, right? So, sorry, just to be clear, so for an example like that to work, they would have fed the system with millions, millions of pictures of dogs, millions of pictures of wood, millions of pictures of sand, and then... That has it. been labeled manually by humans. Okay. In, in, in fact, what they did, they, they make some kind of game. Yeah. Okay, so you were logging out a picture, 
and, and there was another person in the world that was logging on, on the same picture, and you will earn points if you uh, find uh, information in the picture that the opponent didn't find. Basically, this, is, this was the idea. Because uh, I, I don't see a master student. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes? But will it just be millions of pictures of women and dogs, or will it also be with men and... Men, cars, and uh, whatever. The, the data set we call, it's called ImageNet. You can see it, it's a perfect data set, so you can see it uh, and see how it did work. It's all the story of all the images that are in front. Of course, they, they, this is not only deep learning. There are some kind of what we call segmentation of the picture, that is another kind of algorithm that has been used to prepare the data and so on. But basically, deep learning is under that. So uh, deep learning is very good for image recognition. Uh, it's basically state of the art. The same thing for video processing, natural language processing, speech recognition, alphabet. You know alphabet. It's a very nice uh, game that is the equivalent for uh, Asia that we have for chess, but infinitely more difficult. It has been the, the most difficult for, for people in artificial intelligence since the 80s. Everybody said that what, this was the um, uh, impossible task, as the AI task. And uh, last year, there was a computer that beat the best play, Go player in the world. So that, that's, that's impressive. And there's a, a lot of uh, other things. But we are in the presence of that data. So that's your question. So uh, the, 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 the tendency of overfitting is there for it, it, it can be controlled, but it's an issue. Okay? And there's another problem with, with uh, health science in particular. Uh, deep learning act as a big, the black box. You have one million, one hundred million of neurons. Nobody can understand what is the underlying process that made the prediction. So this is something that is bad for us, okay? Because we want to understand why the predictor says X instead of Y, right? So is there an alternative? And yes, there are alternatives. And I will show you some of them, okay? And tomorrow, uh, Professor Hazelcott will show you another one, and Professor Marchand will show you another one. So we will have some kind of overview of what can be done. Okay. So the, 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 the first example that I, will, I want to present you is the kernel data. Okay. Uh, so what we, we are doing in that kind of approach, we are looking for a predictor, a classifier, that is a linear separator. In R2, it's a line. In R3, is an hyperplan. In R4, is uh, it's uh, cube, <laughs> infinite cube. Okay. In Rd, D can be the size of millions. It's uh, uh, of dimension d minus one. Okay. And and why this is uh, interesting? It's because the the, the following is. You have an input space, and you want to look for a very complicated decision process. But this is algebraically very difficult. So the trick is you take your input space, your x1 to xd that I give you, and you project it in a much higher dimension space. But in this high dimension space, you restrict yourself only to either. Okay, so it's much more simple when you go, uh, at, at the level of the, the map. But you are in a much more high dimension. Meaning that this hyperplan, when you see what happened in the input space, it can be a very complicated decision front. Right. And why this is a good idea? That an hyperplan, you remember your algebra, high school algebra? Mm -hmm. An hyperplan, can be defined by what is called the normal of the hyperplan. Here, here it's an hyperplan of dimension one, so you take something that is at 80 degrees. If it's a plan, you also have this normal stuff and so on. And why it is interesting if your decision process is an hyperplan, it's because if you have an example in your very high dimension feature space, you simply have to make the scalar product. It's a very easy calculation to make. And if the scalar product is positive, 
then you know that you are in the same side of the hyperplan as your normal, do this clear plus one. And if you are in the other side, then the scalar product would be negative, declare one. Okay? And also another point that is important in kernel method, so we are looking for linear separator. But what kind of linear separator we should choose? Because sometimes we have many choices. So we will try to find a linear separator that will maximize what is called the margin. The margin is the demilitary zone between the positive and the negative. So there, there is nobody in the training set in, in, in the margin. So you, here you see, if you take this frontier, this guy is very close. If you take this frontier, this guy is very close. The, the best way to do it is to put the maximum possible demilitary zone, what is called the margin, right? And there are some proof that this prevent very efficiently what we have called a repeating before, right? More example, one, one formula, uh, I have a of that, okay? Uh, Basically, what the, the, the super vector machine, which is one of the kernel method, and the most popular, I would say, kernel method, is doing, is the following. Uh, I recall you that W is basically the thing that is defined the, 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 the hyperplan that you are designed. So what we try to do, basically, is to define, this is basically the norm of the vector W that you have to define. And this is what? This is the, basically the number of errors or the number of points that are inside your margin. Okay, and why, why is so? Uh, this cannot be negative, but uh, if uh, the true label is plus one and you predict plus one, this, will, this value is zero. If you predict plus one and the real value is minus one, then you, you will have a two and L. Right? And, and so, this is related to the margin. I won't explain why. But the size of the W is really related to the margin. And the F, of course, is your, uh, what you, I, I tell you, the, the scalar product that defines the dive with that. Okay. So, what is SBM? It's been advising something that is thinking into account as far, as far as possible. Good margin, but without doing too many errors. Roughly, that this is it. And so the hyperparameter C is how many, uh, how much you can accept error, and how to define it, the, the best C. This is something that is an issue that we will see at the end. And if I don't have time, Alexandre will show you at hands up. Okay. But basically, if you you take a C that is very high, so you really don't want to see errors. Meaning that you will have a, probably a smaller margin, but uh, about no errors. Okay. If you take a smaller C, then you will tolerate some errors if you can have a better margin. Which one is the best? Depends on the data. Right. Okay. Good contract for everybody. Okay. Um, uh, basically, the feature space. You know, the, 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 the big space on which we are projecting our input space can be really, really huge. It can even be infinite. But in, in most of the time, suppose that it's something that is dimension it goes to millions, something like that. Yeah. Does that dimension correspond to the features at all? It can correspond to the features. You, you can decide that the projection is simply the entity. And the input space and the feature space is like this is the linear kernel, okay? but you can want to do much more complicated stuff. And there's a bunch of kernel that exists, and I will show you that we can also invent new kernel that are more adaptable to some specific tasks. Okay, um, the trick is called a kernel trick. Is uh, even if we are in a very huge dimension, the calculation basically can all be done in the input space if we obtain what is called a kernel. What is a kernel? A kernel, a function k, k is a kernel if it simply corresponds to the scalar product in the very huge dimension. 
most of the time, such a function exists. So all the calculation is not in the space of million dimension, but a space of much more smaller dimension. So for efficiency, this is very important. And also what is interesting is for people like you, this can be viewed as a similarity function. So if x and x prime are similar, meaning that they are basically in the same direction in the very huge dimension, okay? So this will take a big value. If they are very different, meaning that in the feature space they are at 90, 90 degrees, then you, you will say that they are very not similar. And if, if it's uh, on the other side, then you will have a kernel that is negative. So people can see that as a similarity function. Okay, so, and this is important because we are talking about we want to get out of black box prediction. So similarity function is something you can understand most of the time, right? Uh, also, what is very interesting is we the, because of the kernel trick, the the prediction function that we want to define <coughs> can be viewed as a linear combination of the the similarity function between example in your training data and example to predict on. Okay, so, so you will decide that uh, x will be a plus because it's much more similar to example that are plus in my Fisher space. So this means that those guys will be high value. And it will be a minus if it's more similar to uh, example in my training data that are related to mine. But of course, in the feature space, very high dimensional feature space, right? Uh, the idea is uh, if you have not too many alpha i that are non-zero, or not too many examples in your training, this can be interpretable. Not the best way of being interpretable, but much more interpretable than, for example, uh, uh, neural network. And there are some techniques to make uh, as, possible, as many alpha i as possible as zero to ensure the, the, the interpretability. It, yeah, for example, since they have something that's called relevant vector machine that only take xi that are relevant in some way. Okay. Uh, I didn't yes. understand this last part. So what's alpha i? Alpha i is a, is a weight. Okay, the, everything is a, it's about the majority vote, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, alpha i is a weight. So and uh, y i is what the example x i is thinking of. So uh, suppose, suppose all alpha i are one, for example. So you are in basically democratic. Every example in training set has the same inter interest for you. Okay, then you look at uh, how, how many uh, what x are, are x is close to what kind of example. Uh, it, it, the example uh, that are most of the time minus one, then what will happen to the sum? It will be negative. So we would predict minus one. If it's more, the, the x is closer to people that, that are plus one, then the, the y, y is plus one because this guy is taking plus one, and so if the majority is taking that. So basically, alpha is the weight of the majority vote, roughly. Is it okay? Uh, it's not something that I want you to understand completely, just the big picture. Okay, uh, interesting thing also, it's uh, for, to make all the calculation, we don't know to, to know uh, anything about the big feature space that I tell you. What we have to construct is called a gram matrix. What is a gram matrix? It's simply a matrix where entry are of the form x i x j with uh, xi and xv, two examples of your training set. Yes, as, as an example of a gram matrix, in the race surveyor you, tutorial, you there was a gram matrix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As an example. Uh-oh. <laughs> you have seen that? Yeah. This is a gram matrix. Okay. So, race surveyor is constructing a gram matrix. 
So, shut my. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, so, but to continue, uh, what is very interesting with the kernel method, I, I, I don't expect that the three next slides you will understand and fully of it. But I want you to understand that what is very interesting with kernel method is we can work with people from a domain, for example, a microbiome, to design new kernel. Of course, there's a lot of mathematical law that has to be ensure everything to work. And, but we can speak with you and understand what kind of uh, biological law underlies your problem. And we can we try to then construct a kernel that will include this bio biological law. And why this is so important? This gives steroid to the algorithm. We call that we are in a fat data situation. We don't have too many examples. So we, we have to be very, very efficient on each example that you are giving us. How can, can we be uh, very efficient? If we can put biological knowledge inside the algorithm, then we, we give a hedge to the algorithm, right? That, that's the trick, okay? And that's very important. I answer that Chloe tomorrow will tell you also this kind of story. This is the idea. When we can help you on that, it's because we can help you to design more efficient algorithm by putting knowledge in our algorithm. Yes? I'm just wondering if you can say like some simple example of what type of biological information is useful to you. The GS kernel. <laughs> okay. So the GS kernel is a, a kernel that we have designed in, in the Grail lab, our laboratory. Uh, the, the principle was to, visit, to be to construct a similarity function <coughs> between peptide from the point of view of the uh, capability of a peptide to bind in a, to, a pep, uh, to a protein. This, this was the task, basically. Okay, so we say, well, we are a peptide and we have a binding site of a protein and uh, we want to, to be able to see what kind of when two peptides are quite similar from this binding affinity. Roughly. Okay. And so then this is it. <laughs> so this, it's, it's ugly, but it's not so difficult if, if you understand. But I, 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 will, uh, I will focus basically on uh, what, what was the biological ideas that we tried to input in, in the, into that. And I, all those ideas correspond to some part of the formula, okay? So the first thing is we consider that we count all the substring uh, anim uh, amino acid for a uh, mathematician like me. It, it's simply a word, a string, right? With uh, an alphabet that has only 20 letters. That's it, that's all, okay? So uh, what we do is we look at all the subword that uh, peptide IA has, and all the subword that peptide B has, and we are happy if uh, we find the same subword at the same place. Okay, and we are happy if you find uh, the same subword at the same place, and the word is the subword is bigger. Okay, basically. Okay, that's it. But we can see that. For example, the proline and the leucine has very similar uh, property from the, the binding point of view. Okay? So what we can say is if we have a, a P and an L, they are not exactly a match. But probably that if we just substitute from a peptide a P from an L, it will have similar behavior from the binding point of view. Right? Also, so this is the, this, part, this part of the formula. Okay, so the uh, pro uh, physical chemical property of uh, the peptide, uh, of, of the leucine is very similar to the physical chemical property of peptide P. So we not we will not penalize too much this fact because you know because of this minus, if we penalize too much, then this reduces. If uh, we have L and L here, this is zero, so we have B to 
the zero, we have one, which is the biggest possibility that we can we can achieve for each possible subword. Okay. Also, what we can see is if you have a very big subword in the, the first peptide that is replicated on the second peptide, but not at exactly the same place, then there is a possibility that the, the, the peptide will not bind at the same place, but they will bind both of them. Okay. So what we say is that we will penalize the fact that the subwords are not starting at the same place on both peptides, but not put uh, zero. Okay. We make some kind of leaking function. Again, the minus mean that if you are very far apart, then it will not come, right? And of course, we don't really know how, how uh, eager we have to be with those ideas, so we put some hyperparameters that will be decided, that the value will be decided when we will see the, the proper data. It's okay. I, I don't want you to understand everything about the GS kernel, especially not that, okay? And especially not that this kernel has the mathematical property that is called positive semi-definite. That's the reason that there are some exponential in that. But you see the idea, okay? We discuss, in fact, we discuss with Jacques, okay, and, 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 and the team of Jacques, and we say, can, can you explain us exactly what you need for, for that? And we arrive with this kind of ideas, <coughs> and so we define it. And it worked quite well, yes? So here, are you in the putative binding site for the entire length of the peptide? I, I have a binding site that, I, that is uh, interesting for me. But what I'm trying to tell you is defining a kernel is defining a similarity measure between peptides. So I'm looking only on the physical, physical chemical property to decide if the two peptides are similar or not. And I'm hoping that I'm right. And it will correspond to similar value for the binding at least. Right? You cannot. It, it, the machine learning is a no free lunch problem. You cannot have an algorithm that will do everything for everyone, for everything. Right? You have to take care. But I get some kind of maneuver. Uh, I have some kind of value that can I can deal with. Suppose that the key is very, very bad idea. Uh, for a specific task of binding affinity. Then, normally, if I'm looking correctly the, the data when I, I try to learn, I will find uh, that I have to put a sigma value of uh, very high value. So the DK will not come. If the DK is a good idea, I will manage to have a sigma that is small. Right? I, I'm not saying that Everything will work and on every problem, but it, it, it worked quite well, in fact. <laughs> so, uh, well enough that we won in the 2012 uh, the Dana Farber competition about uh, binding with NHC. So that was quite good, right? So, does it mean that for every question you have to optimize the kernel? Uh, yeah, for every, can, for, yeah, every problem. I, you see in SVM, I, you have the hyperparameter C that make the trade-off between the margin and the errors. Now I have an hyperparameter sigma, uh, sigma C, sigma P. So th this is something that I have to deal with when I will see the, the data. Yes, and I have no choice about that. It's, I need to be able to have a very different possibility of making this algorithm. And when I will see the data, I will show you how. I will try to decide the value of C, the value of sigma P, the value of sigma C, and so on. OK, good. I didn't lose too many people. <laughs> there are someone who is laughing. I mean, you understand the idea? I think what you should mention, though, is it's a really a back and forth. And, and, and sometimes, uh, yeah, so something comes out like really crap. Uh, but yeah. then we, we work at it. And, and then in fact, to design this kernel, it takes about a year and a half to be able to prove everything on that. Uh, and and, and uh, 
there was a lot of other uh, issue that I don't tell you about, about the efficient of the calculation, that we had to work on that also. As you see, the formula was quite complicated. And, and, so. and so, as I tell you, uh, Ray Surveyor is making gram matrix. So Ray Surveyor, basically, is trying to find some similarity function between uh, two bacteria, right? So this is a gram matrix. So you can use a Ray Surveyor. Of course, you have to translate the, the value of the color into a number. In fact, Ray Surveyor is derived translating the number into a value of colors. So you view that. It's in the memory of the machine. Okay. So is the information there has to do with like those scanners, basically how, I'm just trying to think about the biology yeah. part that was yeah. fed into the... In, in the Ray Surveyor, for example, you can have, this is, the GS scanner is much more complicated, but in Ray Surveyor what you can see is, for example, you have a hit if you have the same camera at the same place. Okay. And you count the number of hit you have in, in two, your two bacteria. Okay, and if you... Uh, if the number is high, it means that the bacteria basically have the same gene, right? So kernel can be designed in a very simple way, in a very complicated way, and so on. The idea I want to tell you is you can think about it's possible to design the kernel in order to be able to increase the ability of the algorithm to find rapidly, with a few examples, the, uh, the, the predictor that you, you, you are looking for. Okay. Another alternative is called ensemble, ensemble method. It's called majority vote. I, I only want to say about that because Mario Marshall tomorrow will talk about that. Okay. But what happens if uh, you have learned many classif classifiers that are not very good, but you have a lot of them? Possibly because you only uh, each classifier has been learned on part of the data in the situation where you have a very, very, very big data, or you have a very fast algorithm, but it's not really good, okay? So you have a lot of predictors, <coughs> and they are very bad, each one. Can you make them work together? So this is the idea of ensemble data, okay? So you, you can have, for example, I have only predictor that can, have, that can be defined as a horizontal line, a vertical line, or no line at all, right? Can I do something more interesting by combining them? Yes, right? And this is a democratic vote, but I am I'm allowed to have a non-democratic vote if it's better, right? And you have probably have heard about random forest. This is the most uh, known case of ensemble method. Adibu, MinCQ, basically from my lab. It's one of the algorithms that we have designed that is basically uh, an ensemble. Right. Uh, okay. Third alternative, the most interesting, I think, for, uh, for, for, for fat data, it's algorithm that looks to produce sparse classifiers. Okay. The, the, the algorithm I will present is called the self coping machine. It has been developed by Mario Marchand and John Shaw Taylor in the early uh, 2000, and uh, the, idea, the idea of the algorithm is look for a classifier that is, is based, it's a rule-based classifier. So it looks for rules, but it looks to define a predictor that is based on the few, fewest possible number of rules. Okay, so make simple as possible. Of course, we the constraint that we cannot make too many errors on the training set, otherwise we are on underfitting something. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, and there are some theory called sample compression, sample compression theory that prevent the problem of, uh, of uh, the fat data. You see uh, this morning, uh, Marika tell you that the p-value to be tuned has to be 10 to the minus 11 in order to protect yourself. With a sample compression approach, we can go much better than that. I won't tell you about that. I decided that uh, five minutes before the, the beginning not to show you the formula. Okay, but there are some interesting things that is called the sample compression uh, 
scheme. Of course, such a uh, predictor do not always exist. Okay, if it's not, if there's no such good predictor. Go back to kernel method or go back to neural networks. But if such a <laughs> classifier exists, we have good guarantee that it will be good in example two to come. We have this called the Occam razor idea, right? So this is very important to say that with this set covering machine approach, you are not sure that you will find something interesting. But if you do, then you are really in business. Because it will be interpretable, because it will be a small number of rules that you will, can, you will be able to understand. And also, you, you will have good guarantee, for example. So interpretable, valuable, and very, very, very fast. So I, may I present you cover? That is the set of a machine that has been adapted for genomic data. Okay. So what, what is the idea? So we are thinking about uh, uh, genomic data. So we will consider some string of size k that we call k mega. Okay. And what we are doing is we are looking in our training set. And we are looking at all the chimeras that appear in at least one example in the training set. And this gives you some kind of dictionary. Right? And then for an example x, so you put the, the, your dictionary in, 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 in order. And if the, for this example, if the chimera kagata, Kagata is present, then you put a one in the position respecting this chimera. Then you go to the second chimera of your dictionary, uh, and it's not there, right? So you put a zero there, and so on. And then you construct what? What I tell you that we have to do at the beginning? A vector. A vector of big dimension. Okay. For bacteria, it can be a vector of dimension uh, 100 millions. Okay, so this is real something, right? But the uh, the uh, the idea is there, okay? And what is going to be the set covering machine? The set covering machine will look at all possible rules of presence, of absence of a of a covering. So one hundred million possible comer. So we have two hundred million possible rules. Right? That's a lot of room we can hang ourselves with that. Right? And what the set covering machine algorithm is doing is look at all the rules, look at the data, and now what he's trying to do is trying to find the smallest conjunction of rules that are not making too many errors in the tree. I don't explain what it means to me. Okay? But the idea is there. It's okay? And uh, of course, we, we have uh, out of core implementation, meaning that we can run stuff on a laptop in a very fast way. Uh, the idea is feature selection is not required. We are not limited ourselves to, for example, for human genome to SNPs. We take the whole genome and all the possible came in. So we don't try to make feature selection. We don't want to say, I'm sure that this should be important because we lay the data Decide for us, right? And uh, we have a theory on that, but I won't tell you anything about this. So here is some uh, experiment we make. So we take some family of uh, bacteria and some family of uh, antibiotic, and we will we try to see if we can predict correctly if get, getting the genome of a bacteria if it is going to be resistant or not, right? And so the, the example, uh, okay, you know, the big publicity about, about the read, the assembly has been done by our uh, genome assembly. Okay, uh, so we had a problem at the beginning because uh, uh, self machine don't care about having 100 million uh, features, but the other algorithms are not so happy with that. Okay, so for the other algorithm, what we did is we take a key squares test on all the 100 million chimera possible, and we take the 1 million best. 1 million that has the best p right? 
And for other algorithms, we only give this one million uh, feature. For a set covering machine, no, nothing. Okay. And so what happened? Uh, we are accurate. So if this is decision tree. This is SVM I told you about with the uh, linear kernel. And this is uh, uh, another uh, SVM. Okay, so with, with the competition in machine learning, we are quite accurate. We are most of the time very good in fact. And very good means 3% uh, error on the data set that has a few hundred examples and things like that. That's quite good, okay? But we are so fast and, and scalable, meaning that this takes time, but this has been kept big right? And uh, sparse, okay? So we repeat ten for for each uh, experiment. We repeat ten times and we take the, the, the average. Okay. But basically, set coming machine needs less than four rules. So this is really interpretable. Okay. So you have this. Uh, I will be resistant if I have this uh, this scanner and not this one and this one and this one. So it's a, that this is something that you can give to an expert in, 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 uh, in, in uh, uh, antibiotic resistance, and we did that. Yes. So just curious, that's why you talked about the performance and the need to scale to put it down. So we talked a little bit about the naive base classifier, the 16s, a couple of days ago. I'm just wondering if this might be a good candidate to talk about the naive base because it's really good at handling large I didn't try naive base, but my experiments say that if uh, linear SVM uh, is not better than SCM, I will be very, very surprised that naive base is. Have you tried a naive base no, for fun? So, yeah. But uh, this is something that we could look at. Yes. But your naive base is not interpretable. It's not interpretable. Your ruler will be. On 100 million of features, <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't say that we are the king about uh, uh, antibiotic resistance. I just say that we are interpretable and we are quite good at it. Okay, and this is based on Patrick dataset and uh, from the people from Patrick dataset, they they, they they don't really be able to beat us. Now. But I agree that we didn't try all of the school uh, algorithms. Okay, that's good. So, and sometimes it's only one chemo. Yes? So are the chemo's output with any sort of weights? So that you can go back and see what... Not for now, but this is future work. Okay, because... So you have an important score. It tells you the contribution of each chemo to the model. So how often does it affect the, the output? But this, those results are not considering that. It's really <coughs> perhaps some that's that. So, but we have some kind of ideas. And also we, can, we, we, we would like to see about some kind of uh, uh, how, how the family is spread out and so on. There's some new ideas, but this is the vanilla version. I mean. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you know, then that those came to see if they're around the genes, right? Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. This is something that we want to do. Uh, Yes. Uh, how many genomes are you running for uh, uh, The data sets are about 200, 300. So the, the smallest one is 100, and the biggest one is 12,000. So it's 100, 2,000, the biggest one. So it, it's fat data with slightly big data on it. It's not a 50 example, but nevertheless, it's not so big. From, from, from the machine learning point of view. Okay. Uh, also, we try to say what happens if we only give to set covering machine the, to cover the one million best uh, feature that, that from the point of view of C value. And what we realize is most of the time it's degrading. We make selection, give him less possibility but the best one, and we are not good. And why this is so? Basically, because it's a conjunction of feature, and it's possible that 
given the first feature that's very interesting, the second one might have very small p-value, but when combined with the first one, then it's, it's important, right? We are not looking at feature one at a time. We are looking at feature collectively. Okay. And this was a surprise. We are sparser most of the time if we are not restricting the circuit machine to a specific small number, one million being small number of right? And uh, also what we did is we then we look on uh, the keymer that we have found where they are. Because we can see what, where they are. And sometimes it's uh, on some gene and sometimes it's on other gene. And so we present that to an expert and they basically tell you that, well, you have uh, rediscovered this uh, interesting result. You have this rediscovered this work. By the way, I think, uh, Alex, this is the the one that you will. Yes, this is the one we're going to work on. So you will try to uh, to re 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 recalculate what we've done on this kind of situation. Uh, and, and, and so we, we make a lot of rediscovery for a few hours of calculation, right? And of course, there are some small part that we don't know about. Say, so, well, your information, I'm not sure. Uh, it's, it's not something that I can find. So what can happen then? First, it can be a false discovery that we have done. We think that our predictor is based on this command that is based on this gene, but it's not true. Okay, This is called a false discovery. The second possibility is we find a chimera that is really correlated with another chimera that is really the cause. And because we are in statistic, we cannot infer some, uh, something else than correlation. The third situation is very interesting. It can be a discovery. So now you have to convince people to ask for money to verify if it's a discovery or not. Right? But this is, I think, a good idea to have interpretable because you see the loop between the machine learner and, and, and the scientist. And so this is uh, the idea. Also, what we did is the following. When we find uh, the best comer, we remove it from the future space. And we rerun the, the algorithm and see what happens until the prediction capability degrades. If we can rerun 100 or 1,000 of times, what it usually we find is basically it's a gene, an old gene that is really responsible for, for the, the resistance. But sometime after three, four, or five uh, uh, removal, whoop, the degradation is, is happening. So we will see what happens. And often we find the negation by this way. OK? Uh, and also we have a platform that, uh, uh, on which you can uh, see our, our result. You can also see what is the predictor that uh, help you about that, where, where are the, 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 the chimera in the gene, and, and so on and so on. So if you have fun, uh, we'll give you the, the possibility to, uh, to look at it. I finish, and then, then Georgian, what is the time? I, I have that. Ten. Ten minutes, OK. So the proper use of machine learning. This I will go fast, because Alex is able to do it with you after that, OK? But the base idea is uh, you have I mean, and a, and, and a, a big amount of possible learning algorithm. And for each learning algorithm, you have a lot of possible algorithm parameter to tune. So this means that you have a lot of possibility. Okay? And uh, if, if you want to do it properly, what you have to do is to divide your data into a training part and a testing part. In the testing part, you, you put it away. Okay? This is only for the end of the process, okay? And then what you are doing is you train your training set, you divide it into some fold, five fold, ten fold, and so on. And what you are doing is for each algorithm and each set of hyperparameter that you would like to use, 
to run it five times. Okay? The first time on the first fourth row, and you look how good is your algorithm on the fifth one. And this will give you the test accuracy of that fold. Okay? And what you do, you repeat it for each possible test fold, and you the, the cross-validation score is simply the average of those five. If you have ten fold, then it's ten. And the average of ten then it's ten pounds. Right. And now what you can do is you do it for each algorithm and each hyperparameter, right? And then what you are doing is you take the one that gives you the best CP score. Okay, and is it the best one? This is your best shot. Because you can overfit the, with this situation. But at least at each time, you didn't, your algorithm never see on which the, the data on which it was tested. Okay, and when, when you find the best algorithm and the best list of hyperparameters, what you are doing, you rerun, but now on all the training part, you rerun your algorithm, favorite one, with the set of hyperparameters that you decide to use. Okay, and uh, on, on the train. And then you test on the test <coughs> the predictor you are playing, and only this one. Otherwise, you will have to deal with p value of 10 to the minus 11. Okay, uh, even with this particular method, things can go wrong. Uh, for example, how the data has been gathered. Okay, all the machine learning, 90% of the machine learning algorithm, consider that the data has been gathered IID. What IID means is endemic. It is independently uh, draw to and to an uh, to the same identical distribution. So there's some kind of probability distribution that you can say that is called mother law, uh, mother uh, mother nature, that gives you some sample. And those samples are then in the fact that you have a, 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 a patient will not give more probability to, uh, to see another patient. For example, all the things are base draw IID in such, in such a way, okay? This is something that is not true, in fact. Because if you have a, uh, for example, uh, it's, it's a research on cancer, the people that will be on the, on the, on the data but will be close to their research center that will participate to the study and stuff like that. But we are not so far from that, anyway. But if, uh, and also an example on which you, you will have to predict has to come from the same distribution. Okay, and uh, what can go wrong? For example, you have picture, you want to differentiate cats and dogs. So what a good learning algorithm will do here? Will differentiate between? Balls. Balls and balls. And you say, aha, that's very funny. But it's happening all the time. It happened to the U.S. Army. Okay, the U.S. Army wants to make a machine learning approach to determine if there are some tank in the woods, <laughs> and so they make a training set. But they take all the picture of the forest with tanks during the day, and all the the, the picture without tanks during the evening. And so what the algorithm did? Look the color of the sky, <laughs> and the, the accuracy was perfect. <laughs> okay. And we also make the same mistake once. Okay, we, we make some uh, some uh, massless chromatic uh, analysis, all the the control on one day, and all the the, the, the sick on the on the second day. And what the algorithm did detect the the calibration of the machine. Okay, so this is something that happened. <laughs> I would say that it's called causality, not correlation. Another point that they can go wrong is rarely we are statistical learning, okay? So you know this accident that Tesla ran into a, a truck because it, the Tesla was thinking that the truck was a blue sky because it was all white, and the guy died because he was not driving, he was looking at the video, because he was so sure that the, the Tesla was ready to use. The rare event is something that 
we cannot really deal with machine learning. And I will finish on the adversarial case that is very interesting. So suppose you, you, you learn uh, with deep learning, you learn to recognize what is in the picture. Okay? And there is a, a hacker that look at your, uh, at your uh, predictor and say, well, I will just not take this picture, but I will just mix it a bit, just changing a bit, not much. See, what, you see the difference with one, between this one and this one? Not really. But the, the neural network is saying that this is a panda. And for this picture, he's very sure that it's, it's, a, it's a monkey. And you say, wow, that, that's, that's something that can happen sometime. Yeah. This is what, for the neural network, it's, it's a school star. Small, small modification. What is this? Ostrich. <laughs> this is an ostrich. This is an ostrich, an ostrich, an ostrich. <laughs> so, of course, you are not dealing with adversarial case too much. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> but this is something you have to take into account. And I think you can take it into account in your advantage. Suppose that, uh, and, and I will finish with that. Suppose that you have data that come from two different labs. And because you are in problematic of fat data, you cannot say, well, I will just take one of the two labs. You will have to deal with the fact that from the two labs, there is some slight difference of protocol, and some slight difference of the calibration of the machine, and so on, and so on, and so on. So what you can do, and in fact, this is quite future work for us. So it's not something that we, we have to deal with, but this is an idea we want to explore. OK, so this is a neural network that I'll tell you. Okay? So the neural network is trying to do what? To find a representation <coughs> for which the, the prediction task that, you, that is of your interest will be good. Okay? Now, what if I add an adversarial uh, neuron? And, and the, 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 then what I ask my neural network to do is to find a representation that is good for my prediction task, but for which it's very difficult for me to identify from which lab the data is coming from. So I want a representation that is good on the prediction task, but that is bad to be able to differentiate from which lab the data is coming from. What will mean this? Then the, 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 the neural network we we'll have to not taking into account information that is specific to one or other lab, and only to take into account what is common from the two lab. And if he is still good at prediction, I think in this case we will alleviate this. Uh, at the, 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 the data is quite different. And if you look at it. So here is the, the toy data set called the two moon. Okay? So if you learn a neural network on the, on the two moon data, you see that it's very good at it. Okay? If you add the data of the second, the second lab, and you ask the training to be both trying to predict correctly and to be adversarial, you see that it has a more, it's more difficult for the algorithm to find the, the frontier. It has more difficulties. But what happened with, it, with, if we use this representation that has been learned on that, what happened if we, with this representation, we try to, uh, no electricity? No. Anyway, what happened if we, ah, oh, it's better, yes. What, what, what happened if we try to, differentiate the upper part, which is plus one, to the lower part. It has some difficulty because the, le the learned representation was for this task. But it, it's not so bad anymore. It's not perfect, but not totally bad. 
What happened with this representation? Then the other can do anything. Of course, it's a toy, it's a toy data set, and it's not necessarily the case with uh, true, true data set and so on. But this is extremely ideal. And so I think it's some kind of solution that we can deal with when we will have to deal with data that will come from different parts of the of the world with different protocol, but slightly the same protocol. Of course, if they are two different, then there's nothing to do. But I think this is something that is interesting. Take home message. You, know, you should now know how to get a situation where machine learning is suitable for you. Basically, you need label example, right? Second take home message. Be aware of the danger zone. If I can fall into the pit, you can more than me, right? And uh, third, do not forget that you can work with people in machine learning in order to put a, a knowledge into an, an algorithm to, uh, to uh, enhance the performance of the algorithm. And uh, I will try, I will be happy to know when uh, we will help machine learning people to design a fully adapted microbiome, uh, kernel fully adapted microbiome analysis. I'm waiting for that. And uh, that last thing, interpretability, is a good thing. 